Welcome to the third of the Thames Luminaries Lecture Series, a truly collaborative effort to celebrate our local history and local luminaries drawn together by the River Thames. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm from Marble Hill and I'll be your host for these lectures. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to our amazing chair for this evening and for all of the Thames Luminaries series. She's a wonderful lecturer and a literary historian, our wonderful Professor Judith Hawley. Hello, Rachel. Thank you very much indeed for your introduction and welcome to all of you who are here. We have already at least um, 650 um, attendees and you're very welcome to this, the third of our series of talks. Um, there are nine historic organisations who have joined together to put on these talks for you. We are desperate to engage with our audiences. We, we greatly miss you. And uh, we really encourage you to, um, to share your, your feelings, your, your thoughts about, um, about Pope and his grotto today. I'm particularly delighted to introduce Dr. Marion Harney to you because of her involvement with Pope's Grotto. I'm one of the trustees of the Pope's Grotto Preservation Trust. And Marion has been uh, there from the start, uh, working with us to restore Pope's Grotto or to preserve it for future generations. And I'm pleased to be able to announce that we now have permission from the National Lottery Heritage Fund to go ahead with the preservation work. So we'll be starting that quite soon. Now, Dr. Marion Harney, who you, you might well know already is for her extraordinary expertise in architecture and landscape and, uh, and restoration and preservation, is developing her talk tonight from work she did some time ago for her M. Phil thesis. She researched then Alexander Pope's relationship with Prior Park, a small landscape in the Bath region, and it's the seat of Ralph Allen, who owned the stone mines from which Bath was built and also provided some of the stones for Pope's Grotto. And her project and her interest in, in Pope developed further when she worked in collaboration with her friend and colleague, Professor Paul Richens. Together, they've worked on projects developing internationally renowned research into the application of computer aided design techniques to inform traditional scholarship in the field of architectural history. Now, this computer aided design helps us visualize and analyze important historic buildings and landscapes. And Marion and Paul have been working with Pope's Grotto's Preservation Trust to recreate Pope's lost landscape at Twickenham. You will see some of Paul's work in progress in the digitally recreated images during this talk. And I'm very pleased to hand you over now to Dr. Marion Harney. Hello, good evening, everyone. 18th century literature, landscape and architecture are expressions of complex cultural ideas, aesthetic needs and intricate human experience. The early 18th century was pivotal in the evolution of the English garden, seeing the transition from the formal Baroque to the idea of contrived natural landscape. Alexander Pope was the principal literary genius of his day and the leading poet of his generation. He was at the center of a circle of influential patrons and artists in this early phase of interrelated revivals of classical architecture and innovative approaches to landscape design. Pope's poetry and essays describe his own and contemporary aristocratic society's attitude to landscape and architecture, and their response manifested itself in denigration of the artificial in landscape design and advocated a naturalistic approach. He was considered something of a pioneer of the landscape movement with his Guardian essay of 1713. At this time, Baroque layouts were prevalent, which were stylized, uniform and geometrical, with planting severely manicured into architectural forms and variety provided by variations in surface textures, color, elaborate fountains, water features and statuary. Pope reacted against these gardens, which subjected nature to the rule of art and rejected unified scenes and grand designs to become one of the main proponents of the simplicity of the ancients 
advocating a more natural landscape style in garden design that worked with nature rather than imposing geometrical patterns upon it. This insistence on responding to natural topography is encapsulated in Pope's line, consult the genius of the place in all. And this concept prefigures the romantic approach to nature. His landscape theories developed and evolved through the combination of composing, reading and translating classical literature, where he experienced these verbal and imaging pictures of the classical gardens of antiquity. Painting also played a significant role in the development of his aesthetics and the gardens projected by Pope followed the classical literary tradition in using art, architecture and idealized landscape, the pictorial effects carefully contrived to evoke moods in landscape. Through his writing and his close association with Lord Burlington and William Kent, he was highly influential and undoubtedly helped to establish the new, star, the new national taste in garden design that would become to be known as the English landscape style, English garden style. The Palladian revival in England, led by Lord Burlington, created a new architectural style with emphasis on reviving the classical architecture of Roman antiquity. It was to create a national aesthetic based on an ideal ancient culture with precedence of moral and aesthetic standards and models of behavior were to become the new taste and their essential qualities of propriety, simplicity, truth, and elegance would be used to define new aesthetics of rationalism, restraint, politeness, and virtue. Palladianism and Pope's theory of poetic landscapes both have their origins in the antiquity of classical Rome and the context of the Palladian revival, the building and the landscape were inseparable. Pope's desire to create poetic landscapes based on this antiquity and illusion was an influential concept and natural extension into the garden of the iconography used in the interior. The poetic garden framed the scene, but always striving to find an appropriate balance between art and nature. This idealization of nature and celebration of rural life and the purity and simplicity of the early Roman buildings had a significant literary provenance in the poetry of Virgil, Horace and Homer and other writers like Pliny and Vitruvius. Pope knew these antecedents having translated the descriptions of the gardens of Alcinius from Homer's Odyssey in 1713 and other examples of the amiable simplicity of honored unadored nature are all significantly descriptions from the classical poets. Pliny's detailed accounts of his two villas at Laurentum and Tifernum were particularly influential. The publication of Robert Castell's The Villa of the Ancients Illustrated also played an important role as it contained detailed descriptions of the layout of Pliny's villas and reconstructions of his Roman gardens. And as you see, this slide here is the one of Pliny's gardens at Laurentum and we'll see Typhernum in a little while. Pope contrasts these gardens, which were ornamental, but also utilitarian and practical, containing an orchard, vineyard and herb and kitchen garden with the contemporary practice of impractical and contrived formal gardens in order to denigrate the latter using a device he deployed throughout his literary career of correction by ridicule. And this is a picture of Durham, which is just about 10 miles north of Bath, of Bath the, um, the seat of Lord Blathwaite. So it, Pope says, how contrary to this simplicity is the modern practice of gardening. We seem to make it our study to recede from nature, not only in the various tonsure of greens into the most regular and formal shapes, but even in monstrous attempts beyond the reach of art itself. We run into sculpture 
and are yet better pleased to have our trees in the most awkward figures of men and animals than in the most regular of their own. Pope's satirising of this penchant for topiary was to effect the change from formal and contrived and instead promoting the creation of idealised landscapes which invoked antiquity, declaring, there is certainly something in the amiable simplicity of unadorned nature that spreads over the mind a more noble sort of tranquillity and a loftier sensation of pleasure than can be raised from the nicer scenes of art. And again, this is um, the Rum Garden, sorry, is it a Toscan, this one? This was, the uh, this was the taste of the ancients in their gardens, as we may discover from the descriptions there are extant of them. The two most celebrated wits of the world, referring to Virgil and Homer, have each of them left us a particular picture of a garden, wherein the, those great masters, being wholly unconfined, and painting and pleasure may be thought to have given the full idea of what they esteemed most excellent in this way. Pope argued for the virtues of utility and rustic simplicity, and he encapsulated his philosophy of the English landscape style with a plea for a picturesque combination of art and nature. He was advocating this concept in his own garden by 1724 and by 1731 was making his theory a subject of his poetry. His lost garden at Tuckenham was a small scale but highly influential 18th century poetic landscape based on classical literature, antiquity and illusion. The garden, open to the public from 1736, was where his theories on landscape were most vividly portrayed and where he was free to experiment with his new styles. However, it is important to understand the cultural importance of the early 18th century villa in relation to Pope's decision to live in a suburban villa residence rather than in the city. The prototype Palladian villa in England, like the new style of gardening, affirmed the purity and simplicity of antique architecture and the political, moral and aesthetic principles advocated by the Palladian revival. These villas were rarely built as dynastic seats or principal residences and could therefore avoid ostentatious display. And the pleasure factor is what distinguishes them from the country houses. They were intended as, pleasure, as a pleasurable retreat from the city and retirement from public life and were meant for the enjoyment and relaxation of the owner and their circle. And Pope would have been free to indulge his theories on garden design in his semi-rural villa retreat on the, bank, the banks of the Thames. In December 1719, during the first year of his residence, Pope wrote to his friend, William Broom, giving a brief description of what he could expect to see at Twickenham. He says, the place I am in is delightful as you can imagine any to be. In this situation, the situation is so very airy and yet so warm that you will think yourself in a sort of heaven where the prospect is boundless and the sun your near neighbour. Such wonders of the enchanted bowers, silver streams, opening avenues, rising mounts and painted grottoes and where during a flood in the following year, he found the prospect prodigiously fine. He enumerates on the features, and you'll see them here in this illustration by Searle, uh, as they existed in the letter of 1725 to the Earl of Strafford. He says, I have a theater, an arcade, a bowling green, a grove and whatnot. In the same year to Edward Blunt, he relays the view from the different perspectives of the river and his grotto. From the River Thames, you see through my arch up a walk of the wilderness to a kind of open temple, wholly composed of shells in the rustic manner. 
and from that distance, under the temple, you look down through a sloping arcade of trees and see the sails on the river passing suddenly and vanishing as though through a perspective glass. The connection between garden design, theatre sets and landscape painting are unmistakable in this comment on the visionary scene he created. In 1726, Pope reported to the Earl of Oxford on a feature that Bridgman had designed for him. I've just turfed a little Bridgmanic theatre myself. And in 1733, he wrote to Carlisle that he will be received into the garden through a triumphal arch. Further additions were in place by 1735. When writing to William Fortescue, we learn, I am building a stone obelisk making two new ovens and stoves and a hothouse for ananas, which are what we know as pineapples. Pope's obelisk seats and urns were relocated in the early 1840s to Gopsall from Pope's villa when it was owned by Sophia Howe and conveyed by coal barge via the Aspie de la Jus Canal. They went to Penhouse in Buckinghamshire in 1919 when Gopsall was sold and they're still there now. It is obvious from these exchanges that although Pope's five acre garden is small, he devised a varied, interesting and entertaining layout that demonstrated innovative landscape effects of perspective and colour. It was an evolving working model for experimenting with his ideas. It contained a variety of different scenes composed of thick groves and intricate winding paths connecting various open rooms and arbors enclosed by dense planting. Here he also created a wilderness and private recesses obscured from public view by judicious planting as well as more structured features of walks and slopes. In his anecdotes, Joseph Spence recalled Pope stating that all the beauties of gardening might be comprehended in one word, variety. And this was exemplified in the layout of the main axis of his garden. The central axis running from east to west gave it symmetry, but this was broken by a bowling green and contrasted either side with the regularity and variety in the inner recesses with urns and statues interspersed amongst the verdure to be glimpsed on the perambulation. He constructed mounts to take advantage of calling in the country, calling in the country prospects into the landscape beyond and smaller viewing points to specific picturesque compositions within the garden itself. This extract from an anonymous contributor to the Newcastle General Magazine in 1748 gives a contemporary account of the garden. Near the bounds of the garden, the trees unite themselves more closely together and cover the hedges with a thick shade, which prevents all from prying without and preserves the privacy of the interior parts. These wilderness groves are either quinconces or cut through by many narrow serpentine walks. And as we recede from the boundary and approach towards the centre, the scene opens and becomes less entangled. The alleys widen, the walks grow broader and either terminate in small green plots of the finest turf or lead to the Shell Temple. And all these latest images you've been seeing are the ones that Paul has recreated digitally from the descriptions and the, and the research we did into the landscape itself. And the, the, it continues, the extract continues. The middle of the garden approaches nearest to a lawn, an uh, open green, but it is delightfully diversified with banks and hillocks, which are entirely covered with thickets of laurel, bay, holly, and many other evergreens and shrubs where nature freely lays forth the branches and disports uncontrolled. Pope's garden, like Pliny's, also contained a practical kitchen garden and a small garden house, two hothouses for pineapples, a vineyard, and of course his famous grotto. 
It is inevitable that many of the features that Pope decided were necessary for his own garden at Twickenham and his experiments with perspective and optical illusions would be translated to other gardens that he was involved with. His correspondence makes clear that the value placed on his opinion and approvals in matters of garden design. For example, a letter to Martha Blunt in 1718 is an example of the subject on which Pope's opinion was considered to be invaluable, describing a typical day spent at Sirencester Park with Lord Bathurst, he says, I write an hour, to, an hour or two every morning then ride out a hunting upon the downs, eat heartily, talk tender sentiments with Lord B, or draw plans for houses and gardens, open avenues, cut glades, plant firs, contrive waterworks, all very fine and beautiful in our own imagination. He influenced many of the principal gardens of the early 18th century, including Stowe, Chiswick, Sirencester Park and here Prior Park, Riskins, Sherbourne, Marble Hill and Beavis Mount for Lady Peterborough, whose garden, he says, I have engaged to finish. Both the plan of the gardens at Marble Hill and the plan of his own garden at Twickenham, drawn by his gardener Searle, had strong similarities with Prior Park where Pope's correspondence link him directly with the wilderness area, which I'll show you in a moment, to the west of the lawn, so you can see where the winding paths to the right of the picture here, that is the wilderness area, and the construction of walks and prospects through the woodland area, the management of water, the grotto and its associated cascade, sculptures, statuary and plantations all of which were located in this section of the garden. Other references link him with the Sham Bridge, and this would suggest that he was responsible for the layout of the wilderness in its entirety. And this is a diagrammatic drawing from the conservation management plan for Prior Park, which gives you the detail of inside of the, um, the wilderness area. So Prior Park and Marble Hill, both featured central lawns with flanking planting and focal points, grottos, stores and kitchen garden on one side and plantations crossed by paths with serpentine walks through groves and circular cabinet areas in the other. The influence of other garden designs is implicit in his letter to Blunt and correspondence with others confirming that their designs also served as a source of inspiration demonstrated by the transposition of elements and features from other early 18th century gardens being replicated at the various sites that he worked at. So all of these gardens took advantage of extensive prospects and framed views, blend the symmetry and regularity associated with classical architecture with the natural landscape and are in complete harmony with Pope's theories of po poetic landscape in the contrast, opening glades and intimate shades achieved through variety in planting. For Pope, the genius of the place lay primarily encoded in the landscape. His application of painterly art to the concept for the formation of landscape and gardens is epitomized in his phrase, all garden is landscape painting, recorded by Spence in his anecdotes. Pope discussed his theory of planting to obtain a particular effect with Spence in September 1739, where he says, the light and shades in gardening are managed by disposing the thick grove, the thin and the openings in a proper manner of which the eye is generally the properest judge. These clumps of trees are like the groups in pictures, and here he was speaking with reference to his own garden. You may distance things by darkening them and by narrowing the plantation more and more towards the end in the same manner as they do in painting. And tis executed in the little cypress walk to the obelisk, referring to the plantations surrounding the monument to his mother, a focal point of his garden. 
Pope also used criteria from painting and created sensations of depth and mood through light and shade and used perspective and grouping in order to achieve variety and an element of surprise, reiterating, reiterating the principle of his theories in 1742 to three when Spence recorded him saying, all the rules of gardening are reducible to three heads, the contrasts, the management of surprises and the concealment of the bounds. Pope believed nature was discovered in and brought to perfection by art. Arts are taken from nature and after a thousand vain efforts for improvements are best when they return to their first simplicity. So all the evidence suggests that he placed particular importance on prospect in the gardens of antiquity, confirming that prospect and the picturesque were guiding principles behind his designs. I shall let his neighbour Horace Walpole have the last word on Pope's success as a garden designer. Writing in his history of the modern taste in gardening, he states, there was little of affected modesty in the latter, when he said of all his works, he was most proud of his garden. And yet it was a singular effort of art and taste to impress so much variety and scenery on a spot of five acres. The passing through the gloom from the grotto to the opening day, the retiring and again assembling shades, the dusky groves, the larger lawn and the solemnity of the termination at the cy cypresses that lead up to his mother's tomb are managed with exquisite judgment. And though Lord Peterborough assisted him to form his quincunx and to rank his vines, those were not the most pleasing ingredients of his little perspective. Thank you. So I'll move on to the final slide. Thank you so much, uh, Marianne, for that wonderful talk. She's leaving up that slide just for a moment for you to register that um, if you'd like to support the work of Pope's Grotto Preservation Trust, uh, there is a, an opportunity to um, ka -ching, to donate to us further. <laughs> Thank you, those of you who have already supported us and um, the work of all the nine organisations. That, that make up this particular group of, of luminaries. Thank you so much, Marion.